So, uh, well, welcome back. And um, um, well, if you've seen any of the previous videos, uh, we've already sort of covered quite a few uh, important concepts, uh, and especially the method of dominant balance. Um, uh, we'll see is extremely valuable as we proceed further uh, in, in our discussion on perturbation theory. Um, so for now, let's uh, sort of look at another uh, quadratic, another quadratic equation. And, and this time we'll see how uh, a naive application of the regular perturbation theory actually breaks down spectacularly, uh, even more so than in the previous uh, uh, case that we considered. So um, I'll just put a link somewhere uh, to, to if, 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 you, if, you, if you haven't had a chance to uh, look at a previous example. Um, so, uh, so let's look at an equation of this form. Um, epsilon x square uh, plus 2x minus 1 equals 0. Now uh, note um, here the important distinction between um, between this problem and, and the class of problems we, was, we were studying before is that the small parameter epsilon is actually uh, multiplying uh, the term x square which in this case happens to be uh, the term of the highest order in this equation. So this is a quadratic equation or um, this is a polynomial of order 2 because of the presence of x square and the small parameter epsilon is multiplying this highest order term. Um, so let's try and solve for the roots of this equation using uh, the regular perturbation theory that we have been discussing so far uh, and see what happens. Um, so again, um, let's assume uh, a solution of the form x epsilon equals x naught plus um, x1 epsilon plus big O epsilon square. So uh, again, we'll just be working to linear order in epsilon just to see uh, what, what's, what's going on. Um, so and let's take this ansatz and put it in the equation and solve for it. So we'll find that uh, the first term epsilon x square gives us epsilon uh, x naught square. And again, uh, just as a reminder, once we have decided that we'll truncate uh, the perturbation series to big O epsilon square. Uh, in all our subsequent steps, uh, we must ensure that we are not including any term of order epsilon to the power of 2 and higher. So we'll always be working with linear order in epsilon. So squaring this uh, x square will give us x naught square plus x1 square epsilon square plus a cross term 2 x naught x1 epsilon. But notice that everything is being multiplied by epsilon. So, so uh, let me just write it on anyway. So, so we'll have x1 square epsilon square plus 2 x naught x1 epsilon. That comes from the x square factor. Uh, but because there's an epsilon multiplying this term, and we have decided to truncate the series to big O epsilon square, um, these two will give an epsilon cube, and these two will give an epsilon square. So we need not consider these. So the only term that comes out of this is epsilon x naught square. Um, so, so, uh, so let me just get rid of these two to save some space. Um, so the only relevant term coming from this factor is epsilon x naught square. Then we have a 2x which will give us 2 times x naught plus 2 times x1 epsilon and then we have a minus 1 equals 0. Um, and again, as before, we'll collect like powers of epsilon. So let's look at the term which does not have an epsilon. That's order epsilon to the power of 0. And this will give us 2x0 minus 1 equals 0 or x0 equals half. And then we can look for order epsilon 1. And then we have x0 square um, plus 2x1 equals 0. So x0 square plus 2x1 equals 0. And this gives us x1 is minus x0 square divided by 2. Uh, so we know x0 is half. So it's minus x0 square divided by 2, which in this case will be minus 1 over 8. Right? Um, so our overall solution for x is x epsilon is half minus 1 over 8 epsilon. So this is our claim that our solution is, sorry about that, uh, our solution is half minus 1 over 8 epsilon. Now uh, do you see what has happened here or why is it 
that something has gone uh, well there's nothing gone wrong in these steps so if you recall our previous example something went wrong in our calculation of x1 itself but in this case we are able to solve for the perturbation uh, problem but there's something else that's completely missing from the solution um, and, and the answer is that um, we've completely missed a second root of this equation because this is a quadratic equation of order 2 and uh, by the fundamental theorem of algebra if we have an equation of a polynomial, polynomial here equated to 0 and a polynomial is of degree n then we must have n roots of that equation um, at least in the complex plane uh, and, and and again uh, just in, in case uh, um, we'll be covering uh, uh, like uh, many concepts in complex analysis and also try and prove the fundamental theorem of algebra and basically the real arena to prove that is is the complex plane so uh, so, so we'll talk about those topics as well later but any poly any any equation of nth order any algebraic equation should have n roots and so uh, uh, so, so although we are working with a quadratic the same sort of uh, algebra could be used for let's say an x to the power of 20 let's say this this equation is epsilon x to the power of 20 and and then if we uh, do a regular perturbation problem we'll just find one root and we'll miss 19 of the roots so it, it really fails spectacularly in that case um, now again in order to see what has really gone wrong here um, we must go back and use the method of dominant balance because it's possible that in the limit that epsilon is going to zero this term so notice what has happened here um, to order zero this term epsilon x squared doesn't appear in this equation and we have fundamentally changed a quadratic equation into a linear equation so there is a fundamental change in character of the equation if epsilon is being set exactly equal to zero um, so it's possible that uh, where we have gone wrong is that when epsilon is not exactly equal to zero but is in the neighborhood of, neighborhood of zero it's possible that x squared itself uh, is becoming very large and so epsilon x squared is it's no longer uh, we, we can no longer justify dropping this even to the zeroth order and again in order to uncover what's going on we must go back to the method of dominant balance so uh, so let's do that um, and see uh, what are the dominant terms in this equation so let's apply the method of dominant balance to this equation and again we have covered this in our previous video the basic ideas so i'll put a link in case uh, just uh, just to review our method of dominant balance now in this case uh, although we have three terms we know that we we did not check for three pairs we we already checked the pair 2x and 1 being dominant and that's not quite correct because it will completely we'll completely skip out one of the solutions uh, uh, so, uh, so so we must retain the term epsilon x square this term must be there and so we must check for other pairs of terms that go along with this that can balance this term so let's check epsilon x square balancing 1 let's see whether that works so our claim is that uh, epsilon x square uh, scales as 1 and this is again the asymptotic notation we introduced previously that these two terms are comparable and so this will give us that x scales as 1 divided by epsilon to the power of half so let's check whether this is a consistent uh, pair of um, terms to pick out and whether these two are actually the dominant terms in this equation under this assumption so let's check what is the order of the first term so the first term in this case is epsilon x square and that will scale as 1 over um, so x square will scale as 1 over epsilon and then you have an epsilon so that cancels so this will scale as 1 which is what we started off with uh, the second term is 2x and that will scale as 2 or rather we can get rid of the numerical factor e to the power epsilon to the power of half whereas the third term is 1 and that will scale as 1 now uh, now notice what happens in the limit that epsilon is going to 0 although these two terms 1 and 3 are both order 1 they scale in the same way are comparable they are not the dominant terms because in the limit that epsilon goes to 0 this term blows up this is the most dominant term because it's 1 over epsilon uh, 1 over something very very small which is very very large so uh, so this 
um, assumption that epsilon x squared balances 1 does not give us a pair of terms which is dominant in this equation, although they balance each other out. Okay, so, so that leaves us with the possibility of comparing these two terms. So let's try that out now. Out now. Um, now maybe we can just leave this part here. Okay. So, uh, so now we'll balance epsilon x squared with x. Okay, and this gives us, cancelling 1x, x scales as 1 over epsilon. Right? Okay, so what is the order of the term epsilon x square now? It's epsilon times x square is 1 over epsilon square, so it's 1 over epsilon. Right? What about 2x? 2x will also scale as 1 over epsilon because x scales as 1 over epsilon and 1 scales as 1. Now this seems consistent because in this case, 1 and 2 in the limit that epsilon goes to 0, these two terms become very large. 1 divided by something very small is very large. So these two terms balance each other and they are much, much greater than 1. 1 over epsilon is much, much greater than 1. Um, uh, in the limit that epsilon is going to 0. So, so this gives us our pair of dominant terms. And we now see that actually x should scale as 1 over epsilon. And so this suggests that we must define a new variable y and recast this equation in terms of that new variable and then solve for, convert it into a problem, uh, then convert it into a problem which we can then solve using regular perturbation methods. Um, so, so let's do that and uh, I'll see you in the next part so of, this, of this video where we'll solve for this complete equation using this scaling relation. So see you there. Thanks.